Hello, my name is Scott. I consume about four audiobooks every week. And nine months ago, I broke up with Audible and I've never been happier with my audiobooks. And I'm going to tell you why you should do it too. And I'm going to tell you how you can get some audiobooks for nothing. That's right, completely free. I'm talking bestsellers, new release, popular backlist and classic novels, the audiobooks that you want to listen to. And I'm going to show you how I audiobook now and how I have access to a much larger library of works than Audible offers and how I listen to 15 to 20 audiobooks each month for less than the cost of one book on Audible. But first, a quick word from today's sponsor, Order. Uh-huh. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, they're not, they're not going to sponsor us for this video. They never want to work with this chicken basement operation again. That they've never actually worked with this chicken basement operation in the first place. Fair, fair point. Did, did they say why? Also, you know, it's, it's a spare room. If it's, if it's got more than a thousand books in it, it's, it's a library. Founded in 1995, Audible was purchased by Amazon in 2008 for 30 mil, for 300 million dollars, or in today's terms a little less than eight hours of Amazon's revenue. I think that's really important. Audible isn't a separate company to Amazon. It is just a brand. iPhone isn't separate from Apple. Cornflakes isn't separate from Kellogg's. Even if those products have their own teams looking after them, even if they have separate marketing, we know they're attached to companies and we know Audible is Amazon. So let's get onto the red flags section of this video and tell you why Amazon and by extension all of its brands are horrible. And let's start with the Uyghur population in China. Since 2017, China has been forcibly incarcerating their Uyghur population as well as other Muslim and small ethnic minorities. There is pretty credible evidence to suggest that they are also committing genocide against the Uyghurs. But we get a focus on the over 1 million Uyghurs being held against their will. The Chinese government has decided to put these people to work and the Uyghurs who resist or fight back suddenly disappear. So let's call this what it is. Slavery. And currently over 20% of the world's cotton comes through the labor of Uyghur slaves. And who buys that cotton for a heavily discounted price? Well, here's the problem. We don't actually know where that cotton goes because a lot of the cotton that is sold is untraceable. Cotton from multiple places is often mixed, meaning that cotton is often of mixed providence. But a lot of companies do know where their cotton comes from. And this might shock you. Not one of the companies who goes to the effort of tracing their cotton is putting their hand up and saying, yes, it's us. We're using the Uyghur slave cotton. Amazon has resisted calls to trace their content, ignoring attempts from activists and concerned humanitarian groups to communicate this or discuss this issue. This is actually pretty standard. Crops such as cotton, coffee, chocolate, spices, tea, palm oil, rice and sugar all have large businesses who resist attempt to trace their goods. There is all verified reports of these goods being harvested by slave labour. And yet, Businesses in these industries who trace their goods do not buy them from slave labor. 20% of the cotton on the market is from Uyghur slavery, but that's just one source of slavery. There are also reports of cotton slavery in India, the United States, Pakistan, Brazil, Turkey, and Turkmenistan. Amazon gets the cotton they use from a variety of sources. They source mixed providence cotton. And Amazon is rejecting calls to trace this cotton. A task which I might add that is relatively easy. I mean, after all, the cotton has to get from the crop to you. It has to be delivered somewhere. It can actually be backsourced pretty easily. The idea that Amazon may not be using slave cotton is naive and delusional. They purchase so much of it from so many different places. It is inconceivable. Slavery is just one issue with Amazon. There are many more. So let's quickly highlight some. Because the cotton used isn't traceable, it's very unlikely to be sustainable. A report by Sustainable Cotton Rankings produced in 2020 ranked the largest 77 cotton users in the world for sustainability. Amazon placed 77th. In 2020, 
the BBFAW ranked Amazon as one of the worst food companies for animal welfare. The only reason Amazon wasn't rock bottom is because it has an animal welfare policy on its business agenda. However, this policy isn't specific, and when it comes to how Amazon treats animals, they are no different from the worst offenders. A 2017 report from the Global Exchange placed it as eighth on a list of corporate criminal companies, citing poor labour conditions and unjust treatment of workers. It has fought attempts for workers to unionise, firing staff along the way. Amazon dodged minimum wage laws by forcing employees to become contractors and to work for less than the minimum wage while paying for their own expenses. The average Amazon employee lasts less than eight months in their job and there are countless claims of unfair working conditions, unfair working rules, expectations and unfair dismissals. Over the last three years, Amazon has one of the biggest spend on political lobbying of any company in the world. In 2021, Italy fined Amazon 1.13 million euros for using their dominant market position to force third-party sellers. Amazon won the 2014 Shonky Choice Awards for deceitful claims about the battery life of the Kindle. Amazon has drawn criticisms from environmental groups including Greenpeace and As You Sow for their commitments and efforts towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions, i.e. they're not doing anything. Amazon has been accused of aggressive tactics towards small businesses, forcing many small businesses to close down. And in 2019, a report by As You So measured 215 companies' human rights performances in relation to sourcing conflict materials from the Democratic Republic of Congo, ranking Amazon poorly, stating that they haven't made an effort to reduce their reliance upon conflict materials. I think it's worthwhile to break down what this actually means and to let people know what is happening in the DRC at the moment. Conflict materials are a materials source from within a conflict zone or a war zone. If there was a cobalt mine in 1980s Derry or World War I Europe that was being fought over by rival groups, the cobalt mined from there would be considered a conflict material. And if you're currently unfamiliar with what's happening in the DRC, there is currently a horrible, horrible civil war which involves the recruitment of child soldiers into militia groups. The children are often given the choice. Join the militia group by killing your friend, that person standing next to you, or say no, and we'll give your friend the chance to kill you. And if you both say no, the militia group just kills them both. It involves the systematic and frequent dehumanization of women, men, and children through rape. Many women living in the conflict zone have been raped more times than they can count. And there are multiple things occurring in this civil war that I just thought were too graphic and horrible to include in this video. It is a war of the most pure and unmitigated evil, and it is fought over the rare metals that can be mined in the eastern part of Congo. Metals which end up at Amazon. Strangely, US Congress passed a bill requiring companies to audit their supply chain and state if they're sourcing conflict materials from the eastern part of the DRC without making the sourcing of those materials illegal. And while the increase of transparency has failed at reducing the demand, mostly because this information has not reached consumers, it does mean that Amazon is conscious of the choice to use conflict materials. It does mean that the use of conflict materials isn't an accident. It means that they know what is happening in the DRC. Amazon's involvement in the DRC has been compared with the action of many German companies during the Holocaust. Amazon's blasé attitude towards this issue makes you wonder, are they really unsure where their cotton is coming from? Let's make this absolutely explicitly clear. By purchasing the conflict materials from the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Amazon is directly funding the militia group. They are intentionally prolonging the Congolese civil war and they are contributing to the torture and rape of the Congolese people and the recruitment of children into militia groups. Amazon is a company devoid of morals and their 
$500 million a day profit. That's right, a day, $500 million a day. It comes at the cost of slavery, civil war, rape, child murder, and the trade of people. They're a company who lies to their customers and damages the environment. $500 million a day. They would still make a massive profit if they did things nicely. And at 500 million, that's just a number on a piece of paper. That means nothing. That is Jeff Bezos's ego. In the bookish world, we talk about cancel culture a lot. We are rightfully unhappy when an author attacks a minority group. And I don't want to diminish that because those actions can be damaging, insensitive, and cruel. But I don't even think that profiting off genocide is the worst thing that Amazon does. Why isn't the bookish world going ballistic over this? When an author does something problematic, well, there's thousands of other great authors out there. I might just pick up a different talented author's novel to read, or I might see if I can pick up their books secondhand. I would never quit reading. But if it was a choice between not reading at all or supporting Amazon, I would give up my favorite hobby. Fortunately, I don't need to make that choice. I am going to give you some alternatives to Audible, and every one of these alternatives offer a better product. Now, these companies might not be perfect themselves, but they aren't funding slavery. They aren't funding civil war. They aren't funding rape. I encourage you to check the ethics of these companies and include that in any decision you make about which company you run with. After all, the issues that I think are important and the issues that you think are important may not be the same. And I am just going to be talking about the products from now on. As a point of comparison, let's just look at what Audible offers. Audible offers a pretty simple system. You pay a set amount which varies based on the country you're watching from, and that gives you one credit a month. A credit can be exchanged for an audiobook. All audiobooks cost the same. Now, there are a few different variations to what you can get from Audible. There are a few different editions which you can get from Audible. And all of this varies depending on where you live. But you can always buy extra credit if you run out. So if you like the Audible model and you just want something similar, Kobo Audiobooks, Libro.fm and Audiobooks.com offer it. Subscription based, one credit a month, and you get to keep your books. Kobo is the easiest one to recommend. It is exactly the same service as Audible for about two thirds of the price. That's right, it's exactly the same as Audible, but you save money. There is no reason not to switch to Kobo right now. Libro.fm supports local bookstores. Every audiobook you purchase, a portion of the price goes directly to a local bookstore. They also offer a gift subscription service, which by the way, if any of my family or my wife is watching, is an awesome gift to give at Christmas time. You can buy yourself a gift subscription. And this makes it the perfect option for occasional audiobook listeners. And also hint, the gift service is fantastic for non-US readers who can't find US available titles in their country. Audiobooks.com has a huge library comparable in size to Amazon. Audiobooks.com offers you two books a month instead of one, a normal credit and a bonus VIP credit. A VIP credit gives you access to a smaller library, which you can access with your regular credit anyway, but it is just giving you a cheaper bonus book to read. It is very similar to the Audible Plus range if you have that in your Audible subscription. Those three services are great, but I want to talk about a company that offers something really unique and interesting. Zigzag with X's, not Z's. Zigzag offers an audio text combo experience. Going for a walk? Listen to the audiobook. Home on the couch? Read the ebook. Kids put a movie on? Whack your headphones on and listen to the audiobook while you read the ebook. Zigzag remembers your spot, making it really easy for you to switch between formats. It also has this really cool pricing option. Books get cheaper the more books you buy with them over a 12 month period starting at eight pounds and dropping to as low as four pounds and there are no lock-in contracts. Unfortunately, Zigzag is only currently available in the UK, which rules me out, but they plan to expand. So if you're watching this 12 months after it was published, it's worth checking them out and seeing if they're in your area. Chirp Books is an online audio bookstore. Buy exactly what you want, no contracts. And they always have popular audiobooks from 99 cents. Almost 
all their specials cost between one to four dollars. They have a huge range of books not on special. So they're perfect if you just want a cheap book and not a specific title. If you're just looking for something fun to read and you don't really care what. They're a great low cost option if you read more books than usual in a month or if you need a few extra books for going on a holiday or you can just buy up when the books are on special and wait until you get around to them. However, Chirp Books is only available in Canada and the US. So far everything I've mentioned is better than Audible and might be a good solution for readers, but they're not services that I use. It's worth remembering that we all have different needs and considerations. So let me tell you how I audiobook. Scribd. In Australia, where I'm from, Scribd is significantly cheaper than Audible. Although depending on where you live in the world, prices vary. Regardless of where you live in the world, what is true is that you will get significantly more audiobook for your dollar. Scribd has been called the Netflix of audiobooks. For one set price, you can read as many audiobooks as you can get through in a month. Scribd, however, has a weird system whereby the library of books available for you to pick from diminish after every book you read, which causes some readers to be very frustrated. And that's such a shame because if you're a big audio reader, if you're reading upwards of five or more audiobooks a month, this system really does represent fantastic value. And there is a real simple way of gaming it. Now I have an older video where I audiobook 19 books in a month on Scribd and discuss how the book availability changes after I read each book. I also discuss how many books I've read that I wanted to read versus how many books I read because there was no other option. TLDR, of the 19 audiobooks I read, 15 were books that I wanted to read, four I picked up for the sake of the experiment, and it should be pretty effortlessly easy to get through three to six popular audiobooks a month on Scribd. And by that I mean new releases or backlist novels that are still being discussed and recently made high quality versions of classics. But I'm going to give you the biggest tip when using Scribd. If you see a book that you're interested in, put it on your save list. For some reason, books on your save list stay available longer. Also, often books on your save list become available again mid-month. So if you read a lot of audiobooks, get in early so that you can have them reappear quickly for you. If you are interested in trying Scribd, I have a link in the show notes to get a two-month free trial. Scribd is very much a service that some people love and some people hate. So click on that link and see if it's for you. And if it's not, you can just cancel. Now for everybody who signs up from that link, Scribd will give me a free months access to their service so it is a fantastic way that you can support this channel while getting something awesome yourself. Scribd also has ebooks available as part of their service which is a fantastic addition for blended readers like myself who read ebooks, audiobooks and physical books. LibriVox. LibriVox is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to creating audio versions of books and they encourage you to download copies from their website completely free. They run on donations, so if you've got a couple of spare dollars, feel free to show your appreciation to them by making a donation, but you don't need to. Most people don't. There are a few catches with this service. Firstly, they don't read anything still under copyright, which basically means anything printed in the last 75 years. But there are some exceptions to that. It does vary based on where you live and where the author lives and what copyright laws are in place. But essentially, you're only getting classics. But lots of classics are awesome. They are read by volunteers, but a lot of the volunteers are very talented. And some of them are actually professional voice actors using LibriVox to get their name out there. There are some great books on LibriVox. For example, I particularly love the version of The Count of Monte Cristo uh, read by David Clark. I highly recommend the Thomas Hardy books reckon, uh, read by Tag Hines. Sometimes with LibriVox, one narrator will begin a novel and another will finish it. Sometimes you get a different narrator each chapter. I recommend checking for those versions and avoiding them. You'll almost always have a narrator you love and a narrator you hate in a collaboration. LibriVox is a fantastic way of supplementing your reading and getting through classics. Libby. Your local library has audiobooks and they're completely free. My library still offers audiobooks on CD, but if you don't own a Betamax machine, you can use the Libby app as well. You can often get new release audiobooks on the 
day they're released. But you are restricted to your local library's selection. You might have to wait in a queue if a book you're after is popular. It's just like getting a physical book from the library, except Libby will automatically return the book for you. There are a couple of ways you can really make this work for you. Most libraries have a service where you can request they buy a book. Requesting books is often considered helpful because the librarians have a budget in which they get to buy new books with, and they want to get books to cater for all of their readers. So by telling them the books that you want, you are essentially making their job easier. Just make sure you specify you want an audiobook. You might have been watching and thinking, but my library has a terrible selection and that sucks. Not all libraries are created equal, but most libraries will let anybody in the state, county or province join. And if you're using an app, you don't need to worry if you're a three hour drive away from the location. Some states are organized in such a way already that when you join one library, you get instant access to every library in that state. I must just say, I hate apps that lock audiobooks to the app, such as Audible. And it's essentially because most of those companies have terrible apps, such as Audible, but the Libby platform is fantastic. If you're unfortunate enough to live somewhere that uses BorrowBox instead of Libby and not as well as Libby, well, I'm terribly sorry. BorrowBox works just the same as Livy, but it is a terrible app. In Australia, our libraries use both, but I only use Libby. It's a real game changer and a fantastic app. NetGalley. NetGalley is a site that gives you access to books before they're even released in return for a review. There are only a small selection of audiobooks available on NetGalley, although they do have a larger selection of eBooks. Now you need to request them and have the publisher accept you. And often you only get the book for a certain amount of time. But if you're lucky enough to get accepted and I get accepted for about three quarters of the books I, I request, you'll have an audiobook before it's available on Audible. I only get an audiobook on NetGalley every couple of months, but it's always exciting to get a book before everybody else does. I am always listening to audiobooks when I'm cooking, cleaning, or walking the dog. I get through four every week. On Audible, that would cost me over $250 dollars a month. Libby, LibriVox and NetGalley are all free while Scribd is $15 a month, which is less if one or two of you are interested in signing up from the link in the show notes. Hint, hint, hint. So in the nine months since I've broken up with Jeff Bezos, I've saved over $2,000, which is enough to purchase a large taxidermy crocodile. Not only is Audible doing horrible things such as funding civil war and slavery, but they're also ripping you off and preventing you from having a taxidermy crocodile as well. It's not just that there are better options than Audible. It is that Every other company I look at is better than Audible. Audible is actually the worst company out there for you, for your reading experience. And they're horrible people. Break up with Audible today and start saving for your very own taxidermed crocodile. Make sure you've hit that subscribe button or click on this one here to see my review of Scribd and how I read 19 books in a month. Bye bye.